On January 17, 2004, a 66-ton whale was discovered beached, it was discovered dead, on a southwestern coast in Taiwan. Two weeks after the whale was discovered, the authorities decided to move the whale from the beach to a laboratory in the city to do an autopsy. Right? They wanted to find out about the whale. What was it like? What did it eat? Where did it live? How did it die? It took 50 men, five zero men, three cranes, and 13 hours to move the whale from the beach onto a flatbed trailer. Like just that little bit took them that long and that amount of muscle. But once the, the whale was on the flatbed trailer, they made their way through the city. And as you can imagine, it's not every day you see a 66-ton whale being carted through the city. So people were coming out of their homes, out of the businesses, watching, taking pictures, and just really curious as to what's going on. And then it happened. As the whale is being dragged through the city and people are standing there watching, the whale exploded. And I mean it exploded. Those whale insides were literally everywhere. On cars, on people, on the buildings. It was a mess. It stopped traffic for hours. The, the people who were there said the smell lingered for days. It was a mess. I mean, can you imagine that? You're watching the 66-ton whale go by and all of a sudden, poof, and now you're covered in whale guts. It's a comical story. It's a true story, but it, it's kind of comical to think about. But isn't that how life goes Sometimes. You're watching life go by, you're watching the whales of life go by, and all of a sudden, something unexpected happens. Something completely out of your control, something that you did not plan on. You're left hurting, hopeless, helpless, confused. You're asking lots of questions that usually begin with, why? But rarely do you ever get any answers, or at least you think you don't get any answers. When the different whales of life explode, what do you do? Today we're going to continue that series, Witnesses, and we're going to look at one of the witnesses of Jesus' passion, his suffering, his road to the cross, and the witness for today is a servant of the high priest whose name is Melchus. We're going to go through our verses once more, but a few at a time. And we'll start with verses 1, 2, and 3 of John chapter 18 on page 8 of your worship folders if you want to follow along. When he, that is Jesus, had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. It was time. Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, one of the 12 closest people, somebody who got to witness his every miracle, like restoring sight to the blind, cleansing the incurable disease of leprosy, raising the dead, somebody who got to listen to his every word. I mean, can you imagine listening to that Sermon on the Mount in person? His every word, and Judas was betraying him. He was betraying him to a large crowd of Roman soldiers who were the ones to try and keep peace. They were the armed guards 
of the area. People who worked for the chief priests and Pharisees and undoubtedly actual chief priests like the church workers, the Pharisees who regulated the religion. This is who the group is consisted of. Now to give you an idea of of what that would have been like, for those people to come and arrest Jesus, I want you to imagine this. Imagine the members of the, all the members of the Supreme Court, all the members of Congress and the FBI showing up at your home when you are planting flowers in your garden to arrest you. I think it's a little overkill. But that's exactly the situation that this was. This crowd of people had come to arrest Jesus of Nazareth. The, the guy going around preaching and teaching and doing miracles. And in this crowd, there were other people. It says some officials, and from Malchus being there, servants of those officials. I don't know why a servant needed to come to this arrest party, but he did. So a guy named Malchus is also there. We'll continue with verses 4 through 9. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. This is a powerful and honestly very intimidating crowd. I mean, you have those Roman soldiers armed for battle. You have those chief priests and Pharisees with warlike faces. You have Judas with that sneer of betrayal. And they are all coming to arrest Jesus. Think about it from their perspective for a moment they probably thought they were in control. I mean, who wouldn't put money on those guys going up against 11 followers of a carpenter from Nazareth, many of whom are, are fishermen, there's a tax collector, there's some random others, but they're nobodies. I mean, this crowd coming to arrest Jesus probably thought they were in control. And yet, what happens? Jesus says, I'm the guy you came for and these, this intimidating crowd falls to the ground like bowling pins. I mean, just, they fall over. If that doesn't tell you who's in control over this situation, I don't know what does. Well, they get, they get back up. They, they try to find their composure. Jesus asks again, who do you want? Jesus of Nazareth. I'm the guy, you should let these men go. Now think about Malchus's perspective for a moment. A servant, a guy in the crowd. A guy who maybe wondered, why am I here? <laughs> I'm not a Roman soldier, I'm not the chief priest, and I'm not a Pharisee, I'm just a servant. He's probably just standing there watching all of this take place. And then Malchus' wail explodes. Verse 10, Simon Peter, who had his sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. First shot was fired. Malchus had been hit. He's now standing there without a right ear, probably bleeding like crazy. His wail exploded out of nowhere. Something unexpected, something out of his control. Peter missed, splitting his head in half and nicked his ear or cut off his ear. I wonder if the tensions were rising even more than they already were. I wonder if the the Roman soldiers who were the best of the best fighting men, the the Pharisees and chief priests, I wonder if they all started to look at each other wondering, "Do, do we fight back? What do we do? Who is in control over this escalating, whale-exploding situation? It 
step back for a moment and let's think about this for ourselves. Whoever you are here this morning, one of three things is happening in your life. Either you're standing in the crowd, watching the whale go by, waiting for it to explode. Either the whales of your life are exploding and you're watching those intestines come flying at your face. Or the whale has already exploded and now you're standing there covered in a mess, wondering what to do next. Where are you at? Are things going well in your life? They couldn't be better personally, at work, with your family. I mean, you are so thankful for all the blessings that God has given you and they're just pouring in left and right. But you know from experience that eventually something's going to happen. Something out of your control, something something you don't want to happen. Are you a little anxious waiting for that whale to explode? Or maybe the whales of your life, one of them is exploding and you're watching it all come at you. It's like you're, it's like you're standing in a boat and there's a bunch of holes in the bottom and the water's just pouring in and you are in the boat with a bucket trying to throw out the water as quickly as you can, but it you're still going down, down, down. Do you feel like you're in the dark sinking all alone? Do you feel like everything you've worked so hard for is just crumbling all around you? Or maybe you're the third option. Maybe you're in the third scenario. That whale has exploded and now you're standing there covered in a mess trying to figure out what to do. Did you have to go to the bank to get help? Rework your budget because it's going to be really tight now that the accident happened or you had to replace a hot water heater or a furnace? Did you have to change your diet? Go on some different medication because the doctor's a little nervous as to what's going on inside and they're not quite sure. Do you have to go find a lawyer? Do you have to go find a counselor, someone to talk through things with you because you, you can't sort out the mess by yourself and you don't even know what to do to make sense of it all? You're feeling pretty hopeless, helpless, afraid? Where are you at right now? Wherever you are, whether you're, you're waiting, whether it's exploding or it's exploded, there's, there's a natural desire, I don't want to say desire, a natural inclination inside each and every one of us that wants to be in control. Popular wisdom tells you that you need to be in control and if you're not, you need to seek control so that way when those whales explode or, or whatever's happening, you, you can control the situation and it won't be that and just to give you an example of how ingrained inside of us that desire is, I mean, think about it. How many of you have that emergency supply kit at home with band-aids and, and gauze pads and, and neurosporin and you're ready for those, those cuts, those scrapes, those bruises? How many of you have that spare tire in your car ready to go in a moment's notice? Is the generator fully functioning? It's got gas inside, ready to plug in so nothing in your refrigerator or freezer goes bad when the power goes out? Do you have extra food and water in your home somewhere so that way if you get stuck at home because of snow or for whatever reason, you, you can go a couple days? I mean, those are little examples, but just think about how ingrained inside of us it is to be in control and to make sure we're ready to be in control for when those whales explode. Don't get me wrong, it's not, be, it's not wrong to, to be prepared, to, 
to have those plans in place. I, I've got my spare tire ready. I've got some water and food in my house. Like, I, I've got things I'm prepared for. But what happens when? And notice I said when. When those different wheels of life explode and your plan doesn't work. What happens when you're grasping for control over the situation and you can't control it? If you recall the last time your whale exploded or is it exploding right now for you, you know what I'm talking about. You feel pretty hopeless, helpless, afraid. <laughs> your natural inclination is to first try and control the situation, but you can't. You ask lots of questions like why, but you don't get any answers. When you're like Malchus and you're standing there ear cut off, bleeding. It's out of your control. You can't do anything about it. What do you do? When those different whales explode, it's the desire to be in control. But I'm going to encourage you today to let go of that control. Relinquish that control. Give it up. Resign being the self-appointed CEO of the universe and give your mess to Jesus. Let him be in control because he is. He's the one who's actually in control and can control what happens in your life. I mean, just look at Malchus' situation here. Think about what's happened so far in our verses for today. Look, at, look back to verse 4. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out. Did you catch that? He, he knew. He knew what was about to happen. He knew what the next 36 hours of his life entailed. Less than 36 hours. 24, you could say. He knew. He knew he was going to suffer and die. When, when the Roman soldiers came to arrest him, he didn't run the other way. When Judas was there to betray him, Jesus didn't run away thinking, oh, i got to start over, find another disciple to replace him. When they said Jesus of Nazareth is the guy we want, he didn't cover up that name tag and go, no one by here by that name. No, he knew. And he willingly submitted to his heavenly Father's plan to save you. He was in control over the situation. And he tells that the Apostle Peter in verse 11, Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Jesus was willingly drinking the cup. He was willingly suffering. He had control over whether he suffered or not, but he, he willingly did. He was willingly bound by those Roman soldiers and led away. He was willingly tried unjustly in a night court. He was willingly nailed to a cross when men dared him to come down, he had control. He could have. He's God. But he gave up that control. He submitted to his heavenly Father's plan so he could save you from all your sins. And then on Easter, he showed you his control. He showed you the power he had over sin, death, hell, and Satan. Yes, even over death, he controlled. He controlled death for you. So someday, by believing in Jesus as your Savior, you, could rise, you will rise from the dead. Not doing anything, but relinquishing that control to Jesus who loved you and gave himself for you. Back up and, and think about Malchus for a minute. When Peter cut off Malchus' ear, Jesus rebuked him. And then Jesus pointed out, Peter, you know how much control I have over this situation right now? In the Gospel of Matthew, who also records this, uh, this event, Matthew says, Jesus told Peter, I could call down 12 legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels who could help me in this moment. Like, that's the power, that's the control I have. But he didn't. He gave up that control to his Heavenly Father to save you. And then in Luke's account of this event, the Gospel of Luke, 
It says that after this, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched Malchus' ear, or where his ear used to be, and he healed him. Just like that. That's the control Jesus had over this situation. He was in control. He was letting it happen so he could save you from your sins. So he could help you when those whales of life explode for you. So where are you at? Are you waiting for the whale to explode? Is it exploding or has it exploded? Wherever you are, it's, it's understandable, it's, it's natural to feel hopeless, helpless, and afraid and to, to, to grab for control, to seek control in those moments. But I'm going to encourage you that your first thing that you reach for, rather than control, is Jesus. Give up that control to him. Take it to him in prayer. I, I told the kids that. When those moments happen, the baby, the first step to do, to, the first thing you can do is to throw your mess on Jesus because he's in control. He will help you. And when you do, do it with that mindset that he's in control, you, you know he's going to because he promises that. You know his word. He's either going to help you clean up the mess right now in this life or he's going to say enough and he's going to take you home to be with him in heaven. That's the control he has. It's wherever you are. Take it to Jesus. Let him be in control because he is. Do you doubt me? If you do, just talk to a guy named Malchus. Amen.